And also because of veterans. This computer's like, I don't know, five minutes long. <laughs> okay, so we've been talking about... Last year, I guess, we started talking about how um, archaeology that proves the Bible. Now, obviously, for a lot of things in the oldest part of the Old Testament, we're going to have a little bit not much to work with, because how are you supposed to prove an individual one person, like, for instance, Noah or Adam or Seth? I mean, how are you going to prove one person's existence unless they left a substantial, like, trail? You know what I mean? Uh, especially that old. Um so we're going to finish looking at looking at the uh, creation. And last week we stopped off at the end of Genesis 1. And there are a few things that I just kind of wanted to bring back up and, and kind of uh, look at at a different angle. And the first thing I want to bring up is a very important question. So we went through Genesis 1 talking about how science – excuse me – how science uh, proves these things. Okay, But there's – there's kind of something that I think is really important, and if we ever start looking at the prophetic books, this is going to come up again. Would ancient Israel have understood it like that in the in the scientific light? No. Now, before you get too far with that, the prophets of the Old Testament didn't always understand their prophecies either. So this shouldn't really necessarily concern us. The fact that the creation account in Genesis 1 is flexible and then it's able to, um, you know, meet with our scientific standards of the modern era. That you see what I'm saying? Like, although that isn't how they would have understood it back then, the fact that it can still relate to that should be kind of an encouragement. You know, what I mean, that it was written for a completely different purpose, and yet it still fits. So, with that being said. They would have understood it as assigning functions to the cosmos. See, what we think of as six days of creation. In other words, six days when something was created. That's not how Israel would have seen the six days of creation. They would have seen it as six days of assignment. Six, day, six days of God creating order. That's what they would have seen it as. Um, for them, it wouldn't have been such a big deal about um, God creating things. And so I'll take you back through Genesis 1 in, in, a, in the light of Jewish eyes. And you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. We'll get right, right back to that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the big point would then be that uh, that God was speaking, not that uh, God was doing. In, in Jewish minds, the, the big point is that God is speaking, not, not that God is doing. Uh, so if we go back over this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this is a summary statement, and if you look at Genesis 2, 1, thus the heavens and earth were completed and all their hosts. You have this as – think of it as parentheses. Okay? You have a summary statement at the beginning and the end. God created everything. So in Genesis 1, 1, that's where everything's actually created. The sun, the moon, the stars, earth, the universe, it's all created at 1. So then we get to verse 2, and it says, the earth was formless and void. Now, what does that mean? Well, God had created everything, but earth didn't have any life on it. There were no trees. There were no hills or mountains. It was just a ball, a ball of lifeless earth. So then, uh, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters, and God said, let there be light. Now, if the sun was already created in verse 1, then why would God have said, in verse 3, let there be light. See, in Jewish minds, the sun was not the source of light. God was. So why would God have needed to create light on the earth where he was if the sun was already in existence? Well, we looked at that in Job or Psalms. I, I get the two confused because we actually reference both those books. That in the, in the beginning, God had a, a thick darkness that swaddled the earth. Um, we don't know what made this cloud up. There was some kind of a cloud that was around the earth. Um, really don't know. So the sun was un invisible when you were on the earth because you couldn't see through the cloud. So God created a light and in the around the earth as he was doing this thing. Now, why did he create light before he created, you know, gave, gave other form to the earth? I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I strongly suspect that it has something to do with, with the function that God was trying to establish the idea of light. So let's kind of press forward here. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning one day. Then God said that there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. This has been mistranslated as saying that um, – well, 
I'll get to that when we look at the flood. But for now, let me just say this, that here God is creating the water cycle. And then we see uh, God creating God creating where the, where the earth comes up and all that stuff. Um, and then in verse – I mean in day four, wherever, where it says um, about the light, God pulls back the clouds and the, the lights are visible. Now, in, in Jewish minds, once again, the sky was kind of – think of it kind of like um, a canvas. It's like a canvas, and um, you're putting little things that are up there. Like they didn't think of stars like we think of stars, that it's like suns but really, really far away from our sun. See what I mean? It kind of makes sense. They didn't. They didn't see the world like that. People didn't know that. that, that. Right. Right. And uh, so then that brings us to an idea that is all throughout Genesis that I really don't want to spend too much time on. I just kind of want to let you guys know about it. The the Jewish word that that's translated in the beginning, God created or, or made. Um, it can actually have a lot of different ideas, and it's not necessarily coming from nothing. In other words, God creating something could easily be God bringing out of nothing, and also could be God um, giving function to it. See what I mean? Um, for instance, how, how, how can I say this? It's not just created, it's also... Um, it, it's hard to kind of get some of these ideas across because the Jew, the Hebrew language is, is very, very limited. And it, one word has, has a whole different array of meanings um but i'll just go ahead and leave that there because i don't want to waste too much time on that the basic idea is that created doesn't necessarily mean out from nothing in in, in hebrew in the ling hebrew language however um the bible does clarify in other spots that god did create the heavens and the earth so i'm not trying to teach heresy or anything um so the day six animals if you notice, and I, I kind of covered this a little bit last week, but I really wanted to draw more attention to this. The day six animals are basically three main groups, domesticated animals, wild herd animals, and predatory animals. If you look on in verse um, – let me see. Um, 24, I think it is. Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth. So cattle um, is the uh, – where is it at? Domesticated animals. Then there is the creeping things, which is actually wild herd animals. Think of like uh, deer and that kind of stuff. It's not talking about rats. It's not talking about snakes. So in Genesis 1, it actually doesn't, doesn't tell us about the creation of all the animals. The only ones that it specifically singles out are the water animals, the birds, the domesticated animals like cows, the herd animals like deer, and the, uh, and the uh, predatory animals like uh, lions. So once again, this brings me back to the idea that death was not a, was not a part of the fall. The creation was created with death at the first, because it specifically says that God created the predatory animals on the sixth day. So that's kind of an important issue. Um, okay. Um. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. Once again, creeps on the ground is is not. You, you shouldn't think of it like that. Um, I would even argue that that's just a downright wrong translation. Um, it, it's much better to think of it as um, animals that travel in herds or in packs, like deer. Um, okay. Um, after it's kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man. So either way, that brings us all the way back down to people. Now, when it says that Eve came from, um, the, came from the rib of Adam, rib is kind of reading, reaching a little bit too far here. It's forcing some, the Bible to say something that's really not his point. The point isn't that God took from Adam's rib, but that God took from Adam's side. The idea here is that God took some of Adam, Adam's stuff, the stuff that made Adam a man, a person. And he took that same stuff and made Eve a woman from that same stuff. So you shouldn't think of God actually removing one of Adam's ribs. Because if you even think about it, that doesn't really make sense anyways. Like... He makes he takes one rib and makes a whole woman out of a rib. That just doesn't make sense, anyways. So once again, the the Hebrew word there is more of from a side, not from the rib. There's a whole different. Once again, people who don't understand Hebrew arguing very fiercely for something that the Bible is not trying to say. Um, so anyways, um, so don't think of Eve Eve like a clone. Some people think that Eve was like the female version of Adam. That they were basically identical people, just one. Well, one had a penis and one had a vagina, but you shouldn't you shouldn't think of Eve, Eve like that. Um, although their their genes were, were um, obviously less diluted than ours are, um, that doesn't mean that they were 
the exact same. Does that kind of make sense? Right. They were different. Right. Right. Exactly. So, um, that takes us to the end again, and I wanted to relook at this. We referenced this. I keep saying last week. I should say last lesson of last year. Um, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This sounds like a command when we read this in English. But, excuse me, but it's actually more of a blessing when he talks about um, about this. It, it's it's kind of hard to see how it's a blessing with translations. But you can kind of see it in the beginning of the verse when it says, God blessed them and said to them. Another way of saying that would be, God blessed them by saying this. And so this was the blessing that God blessed them with. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Roll over the fish of the sea and over the bir uh, birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's not that's not something that's that's bad for them. That's something that's good for them. That's a blessing. They have something to do. It's going to fulfill them. They're going to have fun doing it. It's going to be great. Um, and then uh, right here it says, Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. Now, things in the garden to some extent were a lot – were different. Um, people didn't have to work for food like they did outside of the garden. And so the point here isn't necessarily that, that man couldn't eat meat. The point here is simply that God has created them, the, them this place that, 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 that fruit, food just going to grow for them. They don't have to be concerned about that kind of stuff. Um, once again, uh, the idea here – and we'll, we'll look at this in just a second – is that man – might eat meat. It's not clear. It might eat meat, but man is not a predator at this point. That's the big issue. Now, I'll explain that in just a second. So where it says it gives us, it gives us uh, green plant right here. It's the, the word here in the NASB is um, – every tree which is fruit yielding. Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface. Um, the, 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 it's literally a herb or a green thing. Um, so the idea here is more like God giving specific plants, um, not necessarily saying that God gave every plant in the world for us to eat. Like, hey, here's a weed and a thistle. Let's eat. Let's eat this weed. Let, let's take this. What are those goat heads? Let's eat this goat head. <laughs> you know, that, that's that's not the idea here. The idea here is is God just saying about how He's He's blessed them with this abundance of stuff that they can eat. Um, <clears throat> Once again, you, you can't – nowadays, it's very hard for us to understand ancient languages because nowadays we think very precise. Um, like if we mean something, we say that specific thing. So for instance, if the Bible says, I give you all plants to eat, we think God gave us every plant to eat. That wouldn't have been how they would have understood it. Do you know what I mean? We see the same thing in Joshua. It says that they that they that they killed everyone. Well, they didn't actually kill everyone. That they killed all the massed forces and were able to establish themselves in Canaan. That's just how they talked, and that's how they wrote back then. That shouldn't bother us. That's just how they wrote. Think of it as that's their format. Um, okay. Um, so in verse 30, it says. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, which which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. Now this gets a little bit tricky. Okay, every green herb possibly, but plants were made for both predators and and herd animals. It's, it's kind of unclear what he's talking about. It doesn't sound like he's saying necessarily that the predators were expected not to eat meat. So much as what he's saying is that um, he has created something where they won't go hungry necessarily it seems like he's more talking about how he's provided and blessed them because once again and we're, as 28 pointed out this is god's blessing that he's clarifying what the blessing is so without further um ability to know exactly what jesus what god is talking about we shouldn't push that too far and make it say something that that's not clearly saying um and i don't want to belabor those points too much because i feel like it's just kind of a side issue not really a, a main ordeal um and I already said this, uh, verses 28 through 30, it's not a command that that's all they can eat. It's a statement of how he has blessed them. And uh, once again, I kind of already explained that. So if you go to chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, um, this is what I was talking about where man – the difference between eating meat and being a predator. Um, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, it says, 
And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Now, why, why, oh, why will they be scared? Verse 3, Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Now, see, this, this opens up a whole new era. And so as we're trying to date this, starting next week, we're going to start stop looking at the creation. We're going to start looking at ancient days and start looking at the flood and the genealogies and all that stuff. But a, a big question that we need to ask starting next week is when it says here – let me see if I can read it again. Uh, when it's talking about this, we have to ask ourselves, is there a time in human in human history – when people were hunter gatherers, and that would help us to date this. So we'll look, we'll look at that next week. But just let that kind of idea hop around your head. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. I'll explain it next next week. Um, so now things have changed because humans are now now predators. So when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, and we'll look at this in just a second, but uh, life became more scary, and it was a constant struggle to stay alive. And um, so there, there, there's that whole issue. Um, and now another thing that God's helping is, is teaching them how to hunt for their food. So like deer. Okay. So okay, I already explained about the herd animals. Now they're going to hunt things like deer rather than having things like cows. Okay. All right, so – and that takes us to chapter 2, and it says here, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. It's kind of the the, the conclusion of chapter 1. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. Excuse me. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So a few things that I want to point out once again. Um the first thing is that the seventh thing never ends. The same, the, the same thing that I want to point out is that the idea the, – the important part of Genesis 1 is not whether it was literal days or age days or whatever. That's not the point. The point is simply that God is establishing time. God is establishing order, and he's creating things for the purpose of other things. Like, for instance, when he's, when he's revealing the sun and, and the moon and the stars and all these different things, one of the things that he says is so that people will be able to keep – track of time and, and, and that kind of stuff, and it will be signs for them, all these different things. And so we see that God's preparing for what's coming on the sixth day before the sixth day even comes. You know, and he, then he creates all these other things and you know makes mountains and all these different things. And then once everything's prepared, then he brings um, Adam and Eve into the picture. But as we also looked at in chapter 1, God – or I guess I should say the Bible just kind of skips over something. Like for instance on, on in, in day 6. We have these animals being made, and then Adam is made and Eve is made at the same time and, 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 you know, because it just has it all together. But then chapter 2 shows us that Adam and Eve weren't actually created at the same time. Chapter 2 takes apart and further looks at, at day 6. Okay, So let's, let's, let's hop on. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when, the, uh, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth. Now pay attention to this, okay? No shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Now this is where people get the idea that it didn't rain before Noah. Okay, A, a wrong idea, but this is where it comes from. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living, be a living being. Um, and then in verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Okay, so we don't know when God planted the Garden of Eden, so let's not let's not worry about that. Chapter uh, Verse 5 in chapter 2 gives us three problems, okay? There's no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. Okay, there's problem 1. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. There's problem 2, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Problem 3. Three problems. Now, in the next couple verses, it's going to show us the solutions that God made for that problem. Now, um, before we look at that, I do, I, we do have to ask a very, very important question. 
when is this happening? It says, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth. Is this talking about on day six there was no shrub, no shrub of the field? Or is it saying at the beginning where it says that the earth was formless and void, there was no shrub of the earth? So with that, either, possi either thing is possible. It could be saying this. When God first created the earth, there was no shrub of the field. And and because there was no rain, there there was nothing. It was just it was just nothing. So then, as God's creating order, you know, then He brings water in verse six, a misty stress in the earth, and then seven, uh, the, and then God created created man of the man of the ground. But that still leaves us a big problem there, because chapter one just said that the plants came before man. So we know that it can't be talking about sweeping, going through the days of creation. Because that just it chapter one just said that that's not a thing, so it seems like it's talking about all this happened on day six. Now that brings us to an even bigger question: How can this be on day six if it says that there's no shape of the field when the plants were created back on day what was it four? So I mean, so now we have a little bit of a is the Bible contradicting itself? Is chapter two going against what chapter one just said? Well, a much better solution is. If you notice, and the NESB carries this over, all this not all translations do, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. The idea here is that man was not cultivating the ground for food yet. That's the idea. There were no, like, for instance, corn or beans or stuff like that. Those things were not being grown yet. And then when you get to verse 6, but a mist used to rise in the earth. Now, this is a very tricky verse to translate because we don't have anywhere else in, the, in, in this whole book to compare these words to so most translations will, will skim something around like around this uh there was a mist that went up or something like that the idea is that the water was going on the ground but it wasn't being cultivated so it was just going you know like if you take a hose and you just throw it out onto your yard and it's not like going into a trench or anything it's just going out into your yard that's what it's saying the land was uncultivated. They weren't people weren't growing any corn or anything because there were no people, mm -hmm. and the land, the water wasn't being of any benefit because it, it, the they people hadn't dug trenches or anything, so the water was just going everywhere. And so then you get to verse seven and it says, "Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being." Now this is important because in the ancient world, men, people were created as an afterthought by the gods so that they could do all the work. And the gods could profit from it. And instead, what Genesis shows us is that God gave them something to do, but it wasn't for his benefit. See what I mean? It, he, he didn't need them to make the food for him. So verse 6, God, so God sent the rain up from the earth. The idea here um, that it, the, the rainer went up from you – know, that's a conversation for another day. Uh, so plant life could grow. Then God made man to care for plant life. And verse 8, then God planted a special garden for Adam to live in. Um, and once again, though, the garden wasn't the only place to have land. So the curse um, that happens when Adam and Eve sin. Um, oh, here's an alternate translation, though, before I press forward. I forgot that I had this in, in there. The area was barren and un uncultivated because the floodwaters were not being irrigated. Um, if you know anything about the ancient Near East, that's how they watered their crops, is they had floods, and so they had to dig irrigation canals. Um, this is what Babylon did and all them. Um, anyways, uh, because the floodwaters were not being irrigated, uh, so the Near East, uh, so the, um, no, nothing was able to grow. So there's a few things. When we look at chapter 3, Adam and Eve eventually sin, and they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and... Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. As far as where the Garden of Eden was, it was probably somewhere around these parts here. Up here. And lower lower modern day Turkey, upper Syria, somewhere in that area. There's actually um, used to be a river there that is likely the river that is talking about. Um, but it was long since dried up by the time of Abraham, so I don't know how, if God told them about it, like in Revelation, or if they just remembered through the generations. I don't know. Um, anyways, um, when Adam and Eve fall, fall, there's this curse that God gives in chapter three, and everybody has this idea that with the curse came now we have to work, now we have to die. 
or death enters the equation, I should say. But that's not really what God says happens in the curse. Um, the first thing is God gave work from the very beginning. God gave Adam and Eve something to do. In fact, it says that Eve was created as a helper. Now, helper doesn't mean helper like we think of it. We think of, I'm doing this, you help me do what I'm doing. That's not what it means. Even God is called a helper. Helper actually means someone who's going to go alongside of you with it. Think of you have a team of oxen pulling a cart. They're helping each other. Um, so the idea that God created it where, where women were just inherently inferior to men is just not what the Bible is saying at all. Um, also, work was given from the beginning. Death was present from the beginning. We saw that there's, there's carnivores and herbivores, so death was always there. Um, then we see that the snake is cursed. Now, this also gives us the idea that snakes evolved. So snakes, once upon a time, had legs, and then God made it where they didn't have – see what I mean? That's not what it's saying. The snake, in all likelihood, probably never had legs. This is this is a, a type of, of – um, I don't know if you call it poetic speech or prophetic speech. I don't know which. But it's where you give uh, meaning to something after the fact. Does that kind of make sense? Like, okay, so the snake didn't have any legs. Satan uses a snake to do his bidding. And then God says, so you're going to be going around, going around on your belly. Well, he was already going along on his belly, but this is kind of like explaining why that is a thing. See what I mean? It's, it's kind of hard to explain it nowadays because we think all prophetic things have to be said before the thing happens. But in the ancient world, they didn't. Once again, the ancient world th thought a lot differently than we did. Um, also, there's kind of a, the question of, is it, was it an actual snake or was it Satan that's, that's calling the snake? And that's something that people go back and forth about. Or maybe Satan was speaking through the snake like God spoke through the donkey. So you have a, all these different options, and it's very unclear, so we really can't say which is which because we don't know. <laughs> um, when, you're, when you're in doubt with the Bible, it's always a good idea not to force it to say something that it doesn't specifically say just to prove your point. Just a good thing to live by. Uh, okay, uh, probably a symbol for Satan, and snake already crawled on his belly, so... The Bible's not saying necessarily that something changed there. Um, now, as far as the woman, the second part of the curse, it doesn't necessarily say that women didn't have pain beforehand. L look at what it says here. It says, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Now, this word multiply can mean I can make it worse or I can make it um, make it appear. So, so, for instance, it's possible that women already had pain in childbirth, but that the pain just got worse. And this would also include, include the stuff in um, uh, pregnancy where you are going through like uh, um, cramping and um, nausea and those kinds of things. It, it's very unclear, and that word can be translated either way. So, once again, um, don't think of every single time they see a woman in pain, well, they're just getting what they deserve. You know, <laughs> no. Um, now, another thing that people kind of misunderstand here, it says, in pain you will bring forth children. So if if a woman was going to face death every time she brought forth a child, then why would she bother doing it? Yet your desire will be for your husband. She's going to desire her husband. Um, and this is this is shown, you know, when women, you know, want to start a family and those kinds of things, even though, you know, they really have to throw away their, their physical body. I mean, having babies just tears up your body. It really does. <laughs> Do not recommend it. It, it really tears up your body. Um, but anyways, and it's more of the desire is is for your husband. And he. So how, how else to say this? The curse is, is more like God explaining the consequences. Not so much God cursing, but God explaining the consequences of their sin. Does that kind of make sense? It's, 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 it's inappropriately called a curse. Like, for instance... It's more of the curse of sin, not the curse that came from God. For instance, when it says the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually the prayer that God taught to the disciples, so it's actually the disciples' prayer. See what I mean? It, it's just kind of a misappropriation to say it's a curse. Um, so when it says that he will rule, it's not a command, it's a consequence. Because of, of this of this sin entering the equation, what's going to happen is men are going to be become tyrants, and because women are going to become more insecure, they're going to submit to that even though that's not – the ideal, because they're gonna they're gonna want love. I mean, men are very task oriented, and, and women just aren't task oriented. Um, 
so this uh, women are going to become more kind of insecure and emotional. Not to say that every woman is insecure and emotional, and that no man is insecure. And that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, and man is going to become abusive and tyrannical. Um, once again, the introduction of, of sin into the into the life just kind of changed how that natural um, bond is going to work. Um, so your pain in childbirth and pain you will bring forth children. So what we see the biggest note. The biggest note, and if you if you see, uh, for the Jews, they saw lessons from God in nature all around them. Every time that they saw a snake, they were reminded of something. Every time that they saw the trees or green places on the earth or fertile or fertility or every time that – see what I mean? Everything in nature for, for the Jews was like a constant reminder about God. Um, but one thing that's important to, to remember all, about all these different things that are mentioned in the curse – and I know, I know I'm talking really fast. That's because there's so much stuff to cover. <laughs> um is that uh, whereas before people didn't have to worry so much about death and those kinds of things, now it's going to be a constant struggle. Do you, do you notice how when you're a kid, for instance, you become overly fixated on death and you're worried about death? How am I going to die? When am I going to die? All these different things. What's it going to be like? You, you start having cold sweats in the night thinking about how you're going to die one day. You, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't a thing that people had to deal with in the Garden of Eden. Part of the fall was that. It's it's a constant struggle. You have to worry about finances. How am I going to pay for my, for my meals? How am I going to – see what I mean? All this this complication entered into the equation, and, and that's that's kind of the deal. It's not that, that people didn't have to work before the fall. It's that there's this constant struggle of, of will we survive? My own wife might die and bring forth children, but if she doesn't bring forth children, then we'll die out. And so we're going to have this desire to bring forth children, even though it's going to end us. See what I mean? There's just this constant thing that goes there. So labor and pregnancy um, probably means it was more uncomfortable and life-threatening than it was before. Uh, but she'll be feel compelled to, to have children because of her imminent death. And this is actually going to be a driving force for men too. Um, it says uh, – it says here, then to, and then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have uh, eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. See, God said right there, don't listen to your wives. Just a joke. Just a joke. Uh, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants uh, of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken um, – uh, for you are to du you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So there's a few things. First off, thorns and thistles were already there. We know that because God created everything, and we don't believe in evolution. So the thorns and thistles were already there. In the Garden of Eden, these things were taken care of. <laughs> Outside of the Garden of Eden, it was kind of like a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Um, so a few things. First off, man is going to have to constantly worry about death now, and and He's going to have to constantly work so for the sake of not dying. Whereas before, he had something to do. It wasn't, it wasn't as high stress and like life-threatening as it is now. Like before, he could take a nap in the afternoon and not have to worry about it because the garden would still be there. But now, since he's out of the garden, he's got to constantly worry about this different stuff. Uh, number two, he'll be forced to eat plants of the field because of his hunger. See, it says here um, – Thorns and thistles that shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat, eat bread. So not only does he say that you have to work uh, a lot harder just to survive, he's also saying you're going to be so hungry you're going to just eat eat plants that you find because you're not going to you know you're going to constantly have to worry about drought and famine and, and providing for 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 yourself and for your family and all this different stuff. Number three, the thorns outside of the garden, um, Adam now had to deal with. See. God gave him this level of protection in the garden that – I mean just think about that. Not having to worry about getting sick, not having to worry about your wife dying in childbirth, not having to worry about you know being out in the field every day growing plants. I mean this is a, just a, a big thing. And so people always ask, now hold on. Earliest human societies were hunter-gatherer societies, not cultivators. We will look at that starting next week. Remember that, okay? So life was easy and carefree. Now it's hard and worrisome. Men are men and women are constantly worrying about death now, whereas it wasn't a thing before. It wasn't just that death entered the equation because death was already there, but now it's a constant fear of death. That's the first thing. 
it's an immediate spiritual death. They have the separation between them and God now. And then the, the last thing is that there's a slow physical death that every day – I mean uh, Chuck and I were talking about this a, a little while ago, uh, probably a couple years ago now, uh, where we were talking about the way that your body is slowly starts to die in somewhere in your 20s. In your, in your early to mid-20s, your body is slowly dying until the day of your, your death. And so when we when we hear God tell Adam on that on that day you're going to die, it kind of makes us think maybe he was talking about the gradual death that will end in our ultimate death. Uh, it also says that the only plant, I mean, the only thing that they were not allowed to eat from in the garden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It never says that they weren't allowed to eat from the tree of life. So. That brings us to my ultimate conclusion. See, I thought that it was like the, the fountain of youth. You drank from it once and you were youthful forever. But it seems like it's the exact opposite. It seems like they ate from it continually and it kept them alive and healthy. In fact, if you read in Revelations, it says that the tree of life will be there in the new heavens and the new earth. That kind of makes me think that it's something you eat from, con from continually because if you only ate from it once, then why would you need the whole tree? Why would that be a thing? <laughs> so anyways, uh, the fruit of the tree of life, um, now God didn't allow them to eat from it. See, that's what he was saying when he kicked them out. Let's not let them stay here because they'll see the tree and they'll keep eating from it like they were before. And they'll keep getting more and more wicked, but they'll live forever. So let's kick them out of the garden so they won't keep eating and keep being healthy and, and, and live forever in their sin. See, think of, for instance, Adolf Hitler. How terrible would it have been if he lived forever? Just think about that. If he lived forever and never died, think about the evil people in the world. I, I know if I think if I say evil person, somebody just entered into your mind. Maybe it's somebody from politics. Maybe it's someone from Hollywood. Maybe it's someone you just know personally. Either way, you think of that. Now imagine that person living for forever. Just how terrible that would be. Isaiah. Do what? So as far as what did the fruit of knowledge of good and evil actually do? Well, we don't really know, but it had something similar to the effects of adolescence. Now, I'm not saying – some people have said this. I'm not saying this. Some people have said that Adam and Eve were basically children, and then when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and fruit, it, good and evil, it rapidly matured them into adults, that they went through puberty very quickly, and so now they were able to – you know how kids just kind of, kind of have this little bit of an ignorance to them? Now, I think that's pushing it too far. I, I will say this. Yes, it is interesting how kids go through a process of like this ignorant stage and then to this like mischievous stage and then to this adult stage where they're purposely doing the wrong thing. I think that is interesting, and I think that once again this is one of those um, prophetic things that, that I was just talking about where it's like after the fact. You remember I was just talking about that? Where we can see – in the maturing of our children, a re constant reminder of our fall from the Garden of Eden. See what I mean? And that's what I'm talking about. In the Jewish mind, there were these little reminders all throughout nature that constantly reminded of, of the lessons of the Bible. I mean, anyways, um, so it's something similar to adolescence. I'm, I'm not going to say that, that they grew from kids to adults. I'm not going to say that, but it's something very similar to that. We all experience the disappointment of the fall with the coming of age. You know, you see your kids, and they're so innocent, like Paul right now. He's, he's so innocent. He's just a baby. He's helpless. Then he becomes a toddler. He starts to be a monster, but it's not really uh, like an evil monster. It's like a – well, just like a destructive monster, but like kind of oblivious to the things he's doing. Even a 12-year-old, I mean, doesn't fully understand the implications of what they're doing. You know what I mean? In fact, they say that your reasoning doesn't even um, really solidify until you're about 25, 28. That means everything you do, even in your early 20s, like you're not fully understanding the consequences of all these different things. So anyways, don't want to belabor, belabor that point. But um, that's where I want to end tonight. And um, I really want to just close off our discussion on the creation. I feel like we've looked at all the things that needed to be looked at. Um, so just a few things to summarize. Looking at it from a scientific angle, Genesis 1 can very well be explained. Number two, Genesis 1 doesn't tell us how old the earth is, and we shouldn't draw any rash conclusions. And besides that, Genesis 1, 1, like I said, was a blanket statement. It, it, it covers anywhere from seconds to millions and billions of years. It doesn't really clarify. All it says is that God created everything. 
So make sure that if you get into discussions with people about um, you know, how old the earth is and everything, don't get caught into the dogmatic arguments that Ken Ham has subjected himself to. You know, it doesn't have to be so black and white. Um, there's room for learning. The Bible doesn't tell us everything there is to know. It tells, it tells us everything that God wanted us to know. And the message from Genesis 1-1 is not that God created. The message from Genesis 1-1 is that God gave order, that God had a plan, that God had a purpose. That's the message of Genesis 1. Um, so just remember that. And uh, any questions or comments about the creation before we plow on ahead? Because we're just going to close out there, if there aren't. Uh, it's, it's amazing how... I, I mean, I'm not saying that... <clears throat> Because I'm doing the astronomy book, and it's just, I don't know how accurate it is to how God created the earth, but it's just, I'm amazed how it just, everything is in place. Yeah. I I just, I, I don't, it's hard to understand, like, yeah. he thought of every little thing, where to put it, and how to yeah. make it work. Yeah. I don't know. No, I know exactly what you're talking about. Every time I read about astronomy, I just believe in God a little bit more. You know what I mean? Because it's just it, – for something to be so precise, it's just – saying that it happened by chance just sounds like stupidity to me. I yeah. don't know. Maybe I'm being too narrow-minded, but I really just – it just sounds stupid to say that it just came from nothing. Anything else? Okay. I was going to ask um, – Nicole, how uh, how Jamie's doing? But uh, so I don't know.